And now, Lord, may the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, I, I, it, it's probably no secret I love this time of the year. I love Advent. Uh, I love all the lights, and uh, I love the snow. I haven't had snow in a long time uh, around this in this season, and uh, I really love the star. Isn't the star on? Awesome? It changes colors, and it can flash with a beat. So we'll see if we do that on a Sunday morning. I'm just kidding. Don't worry. Well, we are um, in the next four weeks, we're actually going to be walking through the book of Luke and looking at four individuals and the lessons that we can gain from their lives and how we can see our own lives tied into this story that is Christ coming to the earth. Today, we're looking specifically at Zechariah. Now, we see the, the whole um, story here is covers Luke, in Luke chapter, chapter 1 from verse 5 to 25, and then again from verses 57 to 80. We're not going to read all those today. I'm just going to tell you uh, the story. Um, we see right from uh, the scriptures here that uh, Zechariah and his wife, Elizabeth, they were righteous before God. They were good religious people, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statues of the statutes of the Lord. And the Bible says they were advanced in years. Isn't that a nice way of saying that? Advanced in you're advanced in English, you're advanced in math, you're also advanced in years. So, so kind. Um, so we learned this about them, and we'd also learned that they had struggled their entire marriage with infertility. A great sadness in their culture, indeed in any culture. But even in that struggle, even in that pain, in, in that suffering, if you will, they held on to their faith, keeping that struggle private, and they're uh, 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 holding on to their faith, even in the midst of that and their unheard prayers. One does get the feeling, however, as you read this whole story, that their joy was gone, that, the, 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 um, that they did, in fact, struggle with this and their faith and, the, and their struggle. And so in their silent struggle, all the rhythms of life and faith continued on. Zechariah was also a priest. And it's important to know the context in which this whole story happens. For 400, or 400 years before, God had made his greatest promise. A savior would come to save Israel, to rule in justice, to bring peace, and to make the mercy of God known throughout the world. But after the promise was made, God was silent. Silent for 400 years. The people waited. The priest continued to serve. And so while the heavens remained si silent, the rhythms of life and faith continued on. Then the day came when God broke through the silence. And here we find Zechariah in the temple, uh, 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 offering uh, uh, burning incense before the Lord, uh, bringing an offering, and an angel shows up, a literal angel, like bright lights, shiny clothes, angel and he says Zechariah don't be afraid I love that that's always what angels say when they show up in the scriptures don't be afraid of course I'm going to be afraid but that also gives you a sense of how majestic these encounters are throughout the scriptures every time don't be afraid and he says to Zechariah your prayers have been answered you've we've God has heard your prayers and you are going to receive a son you're going to call him John he is going to fulfill the role that was prophesied 400 years ago, walking in the spirit and power of Elijah, preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah. What an awesome thing, right? What a moment. How does Zechariah respond? How can I be sure? How can I know? Now, it's easy for you and I to judge from, from this perspective, right? We see the story. We know how this all plays out. Zachariah, oh, you little faith. You of little faith. But if you've ever struggled with deep disappointment or uh, it's cemented over many years of unanswered prayers, 
maybe you recognize his skepticism. This had been a prayer of his for his whole marriage. And they were advanced in years. It's easy to assume that they were, they had been married 30, 40, maybe even many more years than that infertility the whole time. And now way past the age of childbearing. And here comes this angel showing up and says, your prayers have been heard and they will be answered. It's clear that Zechariah and Elizabeth both, they had faith in God, but Zechariah had trouble reconciling his faith with this specific point of pain in his life. To say it another way, it's almost like there was a place in his heart where that pain sat and faith had a hard time getting to that spot. You ever feel like that with things that you've gone through? You don't have to answer out loud. Struggles that you've had where you're trying to reconcile, how can God be good and powerful and know everything and leave me with this? These are some of the most basic questions of human nature. And Zechariah is embodying that for all of us. I hear what you're saying, angel, but how do I know? How can I be sure? Maybe he wanted to believe the angel, but he just didn't have it in him. Ever feel that way? In verse 20, the angel responds in verse 19, and the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. This is one of the most renowned angels, Gabriel and Michael being the two, one of the most renowned angels in all of the Old Testament. He says, I am Gabriel and I stand in the very presence of God. Basically, here's my credentials. Who are you to question who I am? You don't know who you're talking to. Um, I was, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news and behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And from that moment, Zechariah could not speak. And it even, we see in verse 65, 63, uh, 62 rather, that he probably couldn't hear either because people were trying to sign to him to communicate to him. Now, when you and I read this, the, our first inclination could be to think God was punishing him. And here he is, he's been waiting for all his life, struggling with this, wanting a child, not receiving a child. And here comes this promise. And then right when it seems like that pain and suffering is gonna be taken away, here comes something else, right? Out of the frying pan into the fire. Here comes another thing. And it would seem like this is punishment. But I wonder if this prison of silence that he entered for nine months, if that wasn't actually the grace of God. Elizabeth did become pregnant, but he couldn't sing about it or shout about it. And he probably could not hear Elizabeth do the same. It's a beautiful thing about Elizabeth, we'll get to in a couple of weeks, but it says here that she kept herself hidden when she was pregnant for the first five months saying thus the lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach she didn't need to parade it she knew what god had done for her we'll get to that in a couple weeks but what if this wasn't punishment what if this was grace manifested in the life of zechariah the angel's words he didn't believe silent a prison of silence but the last words he heard were the words about his son, uh, were, were the words that the angel spoke about his son. Let me read those to you from verses 16 and 17. And he, your son, will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children to, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a pre people prepared. Nine months, these were the last words he heard. They must have been turning around in his mind. These last words spoken or the entire words spoken by the angel. And in those nine months, as these words turned around in his head and his heart, he thought to himself, they sound familiar. These words sound familiar. The last book of the Old Testament is the book of Malachi. The, at the closing of the book of Malachi is when this 400 years of silence 
uh, began. And in verse four, the last words of the book of Malachi say this, but for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like cal calves from the stall. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Sounds familiar, Zechariah. We see in verse 57 of Luke chapter 1 that Elizabeth gives birth. But you know what happens after nine months of silence, this prison of silence for Zechariah? The baby is born. He still couldn't speak. And he still couldn't hear. Where is the grace of God in this? Chris, I think I've answered your question now. I don't think that this was the grace of God or the mercy of God. I think God was punishing him to teach him a lesson. Stick with me. Eight days later, it was Jewish custom is eight days after the birth of a boy, that birth would be brought to the temple and be circumcised. Eight days later, after this child was born, he still couldn't speak, still couldn't hear. And the, those eight days must have been the real trial. It was one, one struggle was replaced with another. In his mind, there must have been so many opportunities to say, I thought the angel told me I would be silent until he was born, and he was born, and I still can't speak. I still can't hear my baby cry. I still can't tell people how wonderful this is and how happy I am. But we see in Zechariah that he was changed. His skepticism was now completely gone nine months later and his faith was fully restored. It seems clear that grace had touched the pain in his heart and transformed it. They want the time came to name the child during this, this ceremony, eight days after he was born, and they were going to name him something, a name that was in his family, and his wife says, no, we're calling him John. And all of the people there said, you can't call him John, no one in your family is named John. It's not a bad name, but it's just not in your family. Keep it in the family. And Elizabeth said his name, his name is John. Well, you're calling him John. And so they go to Zechariah to make sure this is what he wanted. And you can imagine the struggle for him, right? Here he is. He'd been given this promise. He's got a son, but the other promise has, hasn't happened yet. He's still struggling. He's still in this in this disappointment or this great opportunity for disappointment. And you, you, when you read it, it's almost like he reaches and he grabs a piece of paper, slams it down, takes his pen, writes down, his name is John, and shows it to them. What an act of trust and faith that was. Right in the middle of his struggle, right in the middle of his pain, of him not being able to rejoice and seeming like God dropped the ball on that promise he said nope skepticism is gone my i trust him i will do exactly as i was told his name is john let me read to you what happened after that in luke chapter 1 looking at, at verse uh, 64 and immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosened and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts. This is a phrase that occurs often in this chapter. They laid them up in their hearts, saying, what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father in that moment, Zechariah, Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. He said, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my son, child, you can almost picture him holding him in his hands as he's saying this. And you, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. 
for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. What a change of heart Zechariah had in that moment. You see it fulfilled right there and then. God's tender mercy, as Zechariah says it, is there to be found for us in our seasons of silence and suffering. What did Zechariah do? There's three things that I see that he, he did in the midst of his pain and suffering and waiting. First, he looked back for clues of the Lord's faithfulness. Remember, the angel used the exact words from the book of Malachi, from the prophet Malachi. And Zechariah, in those nine months, he must have been thinking to himself, how in the world did I miss this? I mean, it's right there. How did, how did I not get this? Why did I not believe? And Zechariah, his name itself even means the Lord remembers. How could I miss this? How could I have been so dumb? He is so faithful, even when I am unfaithful. He looked back for the clues to the Lord's faithfulness. Second, he dared to make the connection between his suffering and God's grace. You see in this, in this passage from Zechariah that it, there seems to be this belief that all my suffering, all our suffering, is just the backdrop for the display of God's grace. Suffering is temporary. Pain is temporary, and it cuts deep. It passes eventually. Grace is eternal. And God uses and turns around things that feel like suffering, that feel like pain, that feel like longing and heartache. He turns those things and uses them to bring about much greater things in our lives. There is a version or, or this kind of uh, American dream, and maybe it's the Western dream, that life should be easy and, and, and just a cakewalk, and the success of, in life is just that it goes from easy to easy to easy. It's strange to me that that is still our conception when that is none of our experience. Not one of us experiences life like that. We all experience deep pain and suffering in our lives. We all have experienced unanswered prayers. And sometimes those unanswered prayers build up over years and become like cement covering our hearts. And we, if we try to reconcile our faith with those pain points, we, it's almost like we have to set that pain aside and just put our faith here. But we don't know how our faith interacts with this, so we, we don't touch it. And what we see here is, is a man who said, I have seen that that's what I was doing, and the Lord is faithful. I will choose to believe, even though I can't speak, I will walk in the promises of God. His name is John. There it is, world. God's promise. There it is, world. God is faithful. There it is, world. His name is John. Even in the midst of it. God uses these things to bring about much stronger, greater faith in our lives. Zechariah says he has seen. God has heard. Even when I didn't believe, he still was faithful. I'm a part of a bigger story than my suffering, Zechariah says. You, do you know what myopia is? It's a nearsightedness. It's an inability to, to see things that are far away. We use this in, 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 uh, as a metaphor for other things. Suffering can produce a myopia in our hearts and in our faith, where all we see is the thing right in front of us. And Zechariah, we see it in this, this exuberant song that he sang out afterwards, that God, through his grace, opened his vision up to see that he was a part of something much bigger than just what he was going through in that moment. He looked back for clues to the Lord's faithfulness. He dared to make the connection between his suffering and God's grace. 
and he trusted God, even when it seemed like God would not release him from his suffering. Why? Why does this happen? How, how could it happen? How did Zechariah come so far in those nine months and eight days in that prison of silence? Well, I think the clue to that is in his song. He found the tender mercy of God in his silence. And that tender mercy of God is there for us in our seasons of silence, in the things that we carry deep in our hearts, sometimes hidden, the people that you know who are carrying pain currently deep in their hearts. And this season can somehow be a reminder of all that. God reminds us of his tender mercy in the silence. And it's there for each of us to find. So I just want to encourage you this season as we head into this season together, that silence is not always bad. That suffering and struggle is not the final word to the story of faith, that God's tender mercy breaks us out of our myopia and helps us to see his greater plan and helps us to see that he has heard, that he has seen, and that he's close. May each of us in our struggles, in our suffering or pain, may each of us in the face of our, all of our unanswered prayers that weigh heavy on us and unchanged situations, may we also find that tender-hearted mercy of God as we seek for it. Let's pray. Lord, I do thank you that your word is sure, that your promises are steadfast. Thank you that we can build our whole lives on your tender mercy. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here this morning who maybe some of them are in the middle of situations that just feel like struggle and pain and soreness and of heart, sickness of heart. I pray, Lord, that you would help them to see, to, to discover your tender mercy, your grace in the midst of what they're going through. Lord, we, we pray for those who we know who are trying to reconcile how could a good God allow something like this in my life. We pray, Lord, that you would be close to them, that you would show them your mercy, your grace working through it all. And Lord, we pray that this season that we would, we would be lights shining in the darkness, as it were, declaring the promises of God. For Zechariah, that declaration was a statement written on a tablet. His name is John. Pray that you would teach us each what our declaration could be, a faith in the midst of any kind of trial. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.